From the Rafters of Rupp is brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Double Dogs, Friends of Cole, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, There's no doubt that having your jersey hang with the multiple championship banners in the rafters of a Rupp Arena is the ultimate when it comes to the University of Kentucky's basketball history. Hello everybody, I'm Kyle Macy and welcome to Season 4, Episode 3 of From the Rafters of Rupp. Throughout this series, we continue to highlight the 38 players, three coaches, one Hall of Fame announcer, and one endearing equipment manager who have all enjoyed legendary careers representing the blue and white. As we honor this exclusive group of celebrated Kentuckians, they in turn share with us a firsthand account of why their jerseys hang from the rafters of Rupp. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Sean Woods, the outstanding playmaker of the early 1990s unforgettable squad. It was Sean's loyalty, dedication, and overall point guard skills that helped Kentucky claw its way back into its proper place among college basketball's most elite programs. Sean and I began our conversation talking about the role sports played in his formative childhood years. I grew up in East Chicago, Indiana. At the time, it was East Chicago Roosevelt, East Chicago Washington. My dad worked in the steel mill, and my mom was a beautician. And uh, I was naturally drawn into sports. I played all three sports growing up, baseball, basketball, and football. And East Chicago was an athletic town. And during the early 70s, they were rich in high school basketball tradition. So basketball big time was really in, 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 enriched into my soul uh, from birth. Before Sean entered high school, his mom remarried and moved the family to Indianapolis. Once there, the family received help in making an informed decision on a high school that would best showcase Sean's talents both on and off the court. There was an athletic director named Mr. Anslet who saw me play at a camp and came up to me and said, man, you have a bright future playing basketball. I was your parents around. And he went and talked to my mom and they saw my mom on the education that Cathedral was given compared to the other schools. And so I thought Cathedral was a great fit for me at that particular time. As Sean entered his senior year at Cathedral High School, he developed into one of the top point guard prospects in the nation. I asked Sean about his recruiting process and at what point the University of Kentucky entered the picture. The first letter I ever got was from Louisville. And then they just kept coming from in-state schools like Purdue, Indiana State, Ball State. Uh, Indiana University didn't start recruiting me until right before my senior year in the summertime. And I knew Ed Davender was leaving Kentucky at the time. Indiana had just signed Jay Edwards and Lyndon Jones, who were co-mister basketballs playing at Marion the year before. So they were out. And Sean Kemp and I were best friends and we play from the Municipal Gardens. We've been playing together since we were in eighth grade. So we knew we were going to the same school. Now my, my mom was born and raised in Lexington. The whole side of my mom's family is from Lexington. Believe it or not, a little history uh, deal, Henry Winkfield, the first African-American to win the Kentucky Derby, is my grandmother's great uncle. So my, the whole side of my mom's family was in the horse business, whether they were groomsmen, exercise riders. My mom was born on a horse farm, so horses has been embedded into me. So, uh, the, and my grandmother used to come watch me play every Friday and Saturday night, high school, <laughs> drive from Lexington to come watch me play. And I told her, I said, if I ever get a chance, you're gonna get the chance to watch me play every single night, whether it's in college or pro. Sean entered the University of Kentucky in the fall of 1988. The NCAA's Prop 48 rule mandated he'd be ineligible to play for the first full year at Kentucky. While the Cats struggled on the court, finishing the season at 13 and 19, Sean battled through a difficult year off the court watching from the sidelines as Kentucky suffered through its first losing season in over six decades. You know, just going to school and not being able to play and only being able to play pickup and things like that at the Seton Center or going over to Dunbar Center and playing on the uh, other side of town in Lexington, that wasn't enough for me. And it was tough. It was, it was very tough, you know, because I had grown so close to Coach Casey, to Dwayne Casey. And then when that situation happened with him and he left and then Coach Suttonham had to leave, I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, these are the people that brought me here, you know. And so the first thing I did was I called my mom and I said, Ma, you know, can you start calling the schools that were recruiting me? 
to let them know that, hey, I'm open again, you know? And uh, she said, no. I said, what are you talking about? I said, there's nobody here. Um, and she goes, no, she goes, this is the first time you, you have, have had to face adversity of some sort, and you're gonna face it straight on, and you're gonna figure it out. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. Hunt Brothers Pizza has been proudly serving communities across America for over 25 years. Download the Hunt Brothers Pizza app to find one of our 7,500 locations inside a convenience store near you. Are you a sporting shooter, hunter, or looking for the best concealed carry option? Bud's Gun Shop and Range is Kentucky's largest selection of firearms, ammunition, and firearm accessories. Located on Industry Road in Lexington. Prior to Sean's sophomore season, Kentucky was saddled with NCAA probation and a two-year ban on postseason play. In the summer of 1989, newly hired athletic director C.M. Newton lured Rick Pitino away from the New York Knicks striving to revitalize the hard-hit Kentucky basketball program. I was interested in Sean's first impression of the enthusiastic, sharp-dressed, new coach from the East Coast. He came to see me out at the Olympic Festival. Even though I sat out that year, my freshman year, I was still invited to the Olympic Festival of the, of the summer of 1989. And him and Coach Sindak came out to watch me play. And I uh, played pretty good that day. He came in and um, the first thing he asked me was, <laughs> Can I run two miles in 12 minutes? First thing I said was, did Billy Donovan do it? Could Billy Donovan run, you know, two miles in 12 minutes? And he said, yeah. I said, well, I can do it. And I don't know if I rubbed it the wrong way or whatever, but, you know, I didn't know if he was trying me or whatever, but I'd never been asked that question about, can I run two miles in 12 minutes? More so than something that's got to do with basketball, right? So that's that was my first introduction to Coach Patino when he came out and watched him play in the Olympic Festival. Rick Patino is certainly known for pushing his players to their limit. Sean believes Patino may have even pushed him harder than most. The coach saw the unlimited potential in Sean's game and was unwilling to settle for anything less than perfection. I don't know if he was trying to break me or what, because, you know, coming out of high school, I like to score too. He's the first person told me not to score. My job was never to score. And that kind of messed with me a little bit. It did, and it hurt me. So I played mad all the time. And that's why I became a great defender because I hawked the ball because I was always mad that I couldn't do what I was always been able to do. The Cats managed a 14 and 14 record in the first season under Rick Pitino. Sean averaged nearly 10 points a game and handed out a team leading 5.8 assists per contest. Establishing the relentless pressure style of play during the first year of the Patino era had plenty of ups and downs. There were big wins over top 25 teams, Alabama and LSU, but the moment Sean remembers most vividly is Coach Patino's reaction to the 150-95 loss at Kansas. Our four out of our starting five bowed out. And I think that he was really just trying to establish his style of play. Well, we had eight scholarship players, okay? Starting five, four of the starting five are out. We're playing with three walk-ons. And he's still pressing Mark Randall, Kevin Pritchard, uh, Ricky Calloway. <laughs> you know, they're number two or three in the country. And they're just going past us as we're coming up trying to get in white and black. They're throwing it over the top and Mark Randall's dunking and pointing in the stands and so on and so forth. And uh, <laughs> after that game was Vintage Coach Patino, I think he was more disappointed because in his eyes, it feels like we just gave in. You know, getting beat 55. You know, he kicked everybody out. He knocked over all the water containers and the Gatorade containers. And everybody leaves except for one person. And that was Mr. Kite. And Mr. Kite got on his knees and started to wipe the stuff off. And now I'm going to laugh because he tells Mr. Kiley, gosh, Bill, that means you too. <laughs> so Mr. Bill gets off from him. And he goes rubbing out the, out, out the locker room. In 1990, before Sean's junior year, Coach Patino signed high school All-American Jamal Mashman to the roster. Sean shares how even Mash needed help from his teammates to rise to the level of expectations Patino had set for him and the Kentucky program as a whole. Jamal wasn't that guy coming in. He was overweight, 
Uh, he couldn't make his times. And I'm going to tell you, Reggie Hansen made Jamal Mashburn. Reggie Hansen was probably the most overachieving player I've ever played with. And, but he would foul a lot. <clears throat> and he would foul Jamal Mashburn to no end. And Jamal Mashburn just had to get better because Reggie was quick. Reggie can shoot it. But Reggie would foul you. Reggie was strong and, and played tougher than what he looked because he's a real skinny guy. But he made Jamal Mashburn. And Jamal Mashburn grew into that. The Cats' 90-91 season began with solid wins over Pennsylvania, Cincinnati, and Notre Dame. And when the Kansas Jayhawks made their return trip to Rupp Arena the year after the disaster in Lawrence, this Kentucky squad was more than ready. We didn't forget that, that killing that we got the year before. And Coach really put emphasis on how to stop them. And for me, it was probably one of the best, if not the best, games in my career at the University of Kentucky. I had 25 points, eight, nine assists, I don't know how many steals, how many rebounds, but I had a really good game that day uh, on national television, and it was a revenge deal because we were winning even more than that. And then they came back, because we wanted to at least beat them by 25. I don't think we beat them by 25, <laughs> but we wanted to beat them, and, 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 and we did. The Cats finished the season 22-6 and six and were sitting atop the SEC standings. Unable to officially claim the title due to the NCAA probation, the Big Blue Nation made plans to celebrate Kentucky's return to glory in their own way. CM Newton organized a parade for the Cats that rolled through downtown Lexington, honoring this Kentucky team as 1991 SEC champ. Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance. Big on commitment. We never set out to be the largest auto dealer in Kentucky. He just set out to provide people reliable vehicles and great customer service. And for the last 50 years, that's what we've done. Kentucky entered the 91-92 campaign with high expectations and ranked as high as number four in many of the preseason polls. Sean explains the overall mindset of the Wildcat team moving into his senior year. We really felt that we could make a run to the Final Four. Our goal was to get to the Final Four. The coach always, you know, he was a visionary. Then he sold it every single day. He sold it every single day. The turnaround of the Kentucky program from a 13-19 record in 1989 to a realistic expectations of a Final Four run in 1992 is truly remarkable. Sean talks about his close-knit senior teammates who helped lay the foundation for bringing the Kentucky program back to national relevance. I read it, I met him officially when we played together in the Derby Cla McDonald Derby Classic in Louisville. And he had a full face beard and he had tobacco in his mouth and he had a twang that just, I could not stop laughing. And at the time, that was that commercial, Hey Vern. And, and his nickname to me from here on out is Vern. You know, I don't call him Richie, I call him Vern. And he came. He and I came in together. We we're from two total spectrums of the world, and we became best friends. Pell's uh, the personality. Pell had to convince himself every day that he belonged. And you know, he has a cockiness to him, but a good cockiness to him. That you know, he wasn't the fastest. He couldn't jump the highest, but he made himself a competitor to where he was a mainstay and a second team RCC performer, a thousand point score at the University of Kentucky. My roomie. <laughs> Just as plain as all outdoors. Don't want no notoriety. He don't want no fortune, no fame, no nothing. He just want to go through life, do what he's got to do and what's supposed to, and supposed to do. And believe it or not, besides me, he checks on us more than anybody. He reaches out and makes sure everybody's doing good. So that core, we all are close because of the circumstances. And it's a closeness that would never be broken. Kentucky compiled a 23-6 regular season record and won the SEC tournament with an 80-54 blowout victory over Alabama in the championship game. UK continued his postseason run with impressive wins over Old Dominion and Iowa State in the NCAA East Regionals, and after disposing of John Calipari and the UMass Minutemen 87-77, the Cats faced the defending national champs and number one ranked 
Duke Blue Devils in the finals of the East Region. And we get to that game, and I didn't sleep that night. I didn't get eight people sleep, not one iota. I watched ESPN over and over and over and over and over again. Then we get to the game, and it's just going. It's just going, and we're just playing. You know what I mean? When you're in the game and you're in the moment, you don't see it like fans do. You know, you're just playing, you're trying to survive, and you're trying to win the basketball game. You don't know how beautiful the game is. All I know is I could have played 40 more minutes. The Cats fell behind early against Duke. Kentucky trailed by nine at the 10 minute mark when Coach Patino called timeout. He said, now, now we're going to start playing our style of play. Now we start pressing. Darren Fellhouse gets two straight steals. Passes to me, Jamal Mashburn comes back three. House gets another steal. Pass it. Jamal Mashburn steps into another three. Timeout. Now it's a game. The two heavyweight programs slugged it out for 40 minutes, and regulation time ended tied at 93. After a Kentucky timeout and Duke leading 102-101 in overtime, Sean picks up the action. It was seven seconds, I think. Seven okay. seconds. And I get the ball, and the play was designed for me to come off the ball screen. Okay, and either turn a corner and kick, make a play, or throw it back to John for the pick and pop. Kyle, let me be honest. I've dreamed of this all my life. I had three opportunities as a UK basketball player, and I missed all three shots. <laughs> this was my last game, and I did not mean to bank it. I wanted to, at least if I missed it, I wanted to hit the back of the rim and give me the chance to either go in, with a teardrop, and Fellhouse, if you go back to watch the tape, Fellhouse had a perfect, was in perfect position to get the tip in if it missed, because Christian came up on me. And because you're so excited and you got a little more adrenaline flowing, I gave it a little bit more, and it hit that glass, just as clean, square, right in the middle of the square, and boom, we hit the glass and, 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 and went in. We'll be right back after these words from our sponsors. The coal industry's had a big impact on my life. My grandfather was a coal miner, my father was a coal miner. Coal is the largest driving force in our local economy. That's why I'm a friend of coal. Double Dogs is a great place to eat. In a single word, delicious. Kentucky held a 103-102 lead over number one ranked Duke with 2.1 seconds left on the game clock. Sean recalls the play that followed and the disappointment that resulted from what is now simply known as the shot. And Coach Patino said verbatim, the last words, do not foul, okay? He knew the play. We had worked on that out-of-bounds play several times because that was their typical out-of-bounds play at that particular time. And the ball was in there, it seemed like forever. Christian bumped one of them. And John just stood straight up. Darren stood straight up. He, it was the cleanest look he had all night. And he turned around, had two seconds left, put it on the bounce, turned around, and I'm underneath the basket. And when he let that thing go, I'm releasing. I'm like, oh, my man, oh, my God. And I never felt that way ever in my life. I mean, it was like my whole body went numb. The heartbreak of the Duke game is reflected in Sean's memories of the Kentucky locker room scene immediately following this devastating loss. And he had his little briefcase there, the little brown briefcase that he always carried, and he reached in that deal and he got the infamous Sports Illustrated that was published way back when we went on probation and said Kentucky shame. And he just said that, you know, don't let this define your basketball careers here at the University of Kentucky because it's, it's, it's far more greater than this. This is where you come from. And at the time he was saying it, it wasn't as significant to me, John, there. Right. I did it over. Um, but, you know, when you look back at it, you know, as adults, we feel privileged because we are considered the guys that brought Kentucky basketball back to where it is today. After three successful years at Kentucky, 
Sean was the first player selected in the CBA draft. He played for a couple of seasons in the NBA Developmental League before spending a brief time playing professionally in Australia. Sean eventually settled into a coaching career that has kept him involved in the game he's always respected and loved. I started coaching a little bit, helping out high school. So I started coaching at, at, at Dunbar High School. And Danny Haney, he took the job in Florida. He, got, he won the championship and he left and he was going to Florida. And he just walks up to me just out of the blue and said, what you think about going to Florida with me and helping me coach? And I prayed on it. And I just told my wife, I said, I think this is my car. Sean's first head coaching job was at Mississippi Valley State where he led the Delta Devils to the NCAA tournament in 2012. He was then hired to lead the Moorhead State program in 2013, where the Eagles twice compiled over 20 wins on the season. Sean is currently in his second season as the head coach at Southern University. Sean and I ended our conversation looking back at his days as a Kentucky Wildcat. I asked him how he would like to be remembered by the Big Blue Nation as a player and as a person, and what it means to him to have his jersey retired and hanging in Rupp Arena. Come on, guys like you, Bowie, Turp, Jack, all the great players from Wild Wild Jones to whatever. And for us to be considering that the second or third year that he started retiring jerseys, I mean, who are we? I, I didn't know how, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I appreciated it, but did we deserve this? I mean, is, was our journey that significant at that particular time to deserve being in the rafters of one of the most historical college basketball programs in the country? Just a guy who gave everything he had under the circumstances, didn't make any excuses, was with three other guys just like him who was happy to be a UK basketball player and was gonna do anything and everything, no matter who the coach was, to keep it successful. Sean Woods enjoyed a very successful career at the University of Kentucky. He was a three-year starter for the Cats and led the team in assists every year he proudly wore the Kentucky uniform. He was selected to the NCAA All-Regional team in his senior year and was inducted into the University of Kentucky Athletics Hall of Fame in 2005. Kentucky fans will always remember Sean's aggressive on-the-ball defense and his strong drives to the rim that resulted in either two points for Sean or an assist to an open teammate. Sean Wood's number 11 jersey will permanently hang in the rafters of Rupp Arena to remind Kentucky fans of Sean's dedication and everlasting loyalty to the University of Kentucky basketball program. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and hope to see you next time when we hear more tales from the rafters of Rupp. From the Rafters of Rock was brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Double Dogs, Friends of Coal, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, and by Rafferty's.